The cable ship Stanley Anwin was built on the Tyne by Swan Hunter. It was built for cable and wireless as a cable repair ship of 2,500 gross registered tons. It was launched on a snow-clad Monday, the 11th of February, 1952, four days after the death of King George VI. Overshadowed by so momentous an event, the Angwin's launch was muted, with little by way of speeches and ceremony. The ship was named for the chairman of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Board, who had also been Cable and Wireless's chairman from 1946 to 1951. It was launched by his wife, Lady Angwin. It gives me great pleasure to name this ship Stanley Angwin, and I wish Godspeed to all who sail in her. The Angwin's design followed that of the cable ship Edward Wilshaw, making them virtual sister ships. We might call them the chairman class cable ships. The Angwin differed from the Wilshaw in having fewer boilers and extra accommodation on the boat deck. It was designed for a complement of 114 officers and men. Here we can see the officers' dining saloon on the main deck, port side. And here is a glimpse of the cruise mess located further aft. Here we see its first captain, H. Lawrence, with Chief Officer J. Anderson. The chart room was located behind the bridge as can be seen on this six-foot model. Once delivered into the hands of cable and wireless, the Angwin sailed for Greenwich to load its tanks with cable before setting out for Singapore to replace the cable ship recorder. On board was Swanee, Mr. Anderson's cat, Mr. Anderson's pregnant cat, which would literally have kittens on reaching the Far East. The Angwin spent the better part of four years based in Singapore. By early 1956, the Angwin's captain was A.R. Moss, and the cable ship was visiting Hong Kong for the first time. The Angwin was relieved at Singapore by the recorder, so that it could begin the long process of relaying the cables of the West Coast of America Telegraph Company, a job that would eventually be completed by the cable ship Norseman. What Swanee the Cat thought about this is anyone's guess. Captain G. H. C. Reynolds took over command of the Angwin and the cable ship was stationed in the South Atlantic, servicing the South American cables. But by 1961, the Angwin was under the command of Captain Alan Tudor. In that year, the cable ship made two short visits to Ascension Island on its way to repair a break in the St. Helena cable. Some of the crew visited Green Mountain and there was a cricket match. The Angwin's crew won by 14 runs. During the second visit, the Islanders defeated Angwin's crew 5-1 at football. Later that year, a new type of seawater distiller was trialled on the Angwin. It was designed by Mr. G. W. Kitching of the Superintendent Marine Engineers Department and was positioned on the boat deck. It could produce 8,000 gallons of water a day with a purity of 2 parts per million of chlorine, compared with 240 parts per million the 1960s London Mains Water. In October, the Angwin took over the West Indies station from the cable ship Lady Denison Pender. Within a month, the cable ship was racing to bring aid and emergency wireless equipment to the hurricane-struck Belize. 1964 saw the Angwin off Recife on emergency standby duty, taking over from its virtual sister ship, the Edward Wilshaw. This developed into a series of cable repairs of the Brazilian and African coasts, but the Angwin was plagued by engine trouble and one of its crewmen had to be rushed back to Recife suffering internal hemorrhaging and partial blackouts. In April of 1965, the Angwin, now back in the West Indies, set out to survey a safe route for the proposed new cable that would run from Tortula, British Virgin Islands, to Bermuda. On board was an oceanographer from the Lamont Geological Observatory in New York, Charles Hollister. The Angwin surveyed the route as it plunged off the Virgin Shelf and down into the Puerto Rico Trench, one of the deepest parts of the ocean at 
over five miles or eight kilometers deep. The Angwin's commander, Captain G.T. Robinson, described the survey in the Zodiac, Cable and Wireless's in-house magazine. They photographed the seafloor, revealing ripples in the ooze caused by subsurface currents and traces of life. The tracks of the Holothurian, the small burrow-like home of the Pelisopod, surrounded by tracks radiating like the spokes of a wheel, made by the creature's long neck as it stretched to snatch some delicacy, Brizonians, and once an abyssal fish appeared. The Angwin survey took it across the Nair's abyssal plain, a vast expanse of clay and silt, and over the abyssal hills and then up the Bermuda Rise to the end of the proposed cable route, arriving in Hamilton Harbour on the 20th of April, incidentally in the wake of the Canadian schooner Blue Nose 2, a replica of the more famous Blue Nose 1. The mid-1960s saw modernization. The Angwin had been designed to repair armored submarine telegraph cables, not the more modern transoceanic submarine telephone cables, which used much more lightweight coaxial cable and repeaters. The Angwin returned home to the Humber engraving dock at Immingham in December of 1965. The modernization took three months. In order to accommodate new equipment, accommodation and store spaces were reshuffled. The bridge front on the upper deck level was moved forward. The cable test room was moved from the port side to the starboard side and fitted with its own special air conditioning unit. On the bridge, a new gyro compass and repeater system was installed, as well as an auto-electric steering system. The wooden lifeboats were replaced by modern glass-reinforced plastic, and a 26-foot motor launch and a 19-foot working motor cutter replaced the original ore-propelled cutters. The Angwin was now prepared for modern telecommunications and departed for Gibraltar and then Bermuda to lay the shore end of the Bermuda Tortula cable. It was in Tortula that the Angwin and the 9,000-ton cable layer Mercury received a visitor from the Royal Yacht Britannia. His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh boarded the Mercury and was given a tour. Her Majesty the Queen commented on the Angwin's smart appearance. Afterwards, the captains of both the Mercury and the Angwin were invited to a government house reception attended by the Queen. The Angwin was present for the 1969 Expo in Grenada. Cable and Wireless had a pavilion covering more than 2,000 feet and was represented by its managing director, Mr. Henry H. Eggers. Afterwards, Mr. Eggers thanked the captain of the Angwin. On behalf of the court, may I thank you, your officers and crew, for the very valuable contribution which C.S. Stanley Angwin made to the success of the company venture. A new decade saw the Angwin running out the shore end for the Barbados Brazil cable. When this was complete, the cable ship recorder arrived and the two ships exchanged crews. The Angwin, under Captain W. Cross, sailed for Britain for a refit. The refit did not come. Instead, in March of 1971, the Angwin was laid up. The decision was made to scrap the cable ship. And on Tuesday the 16th of May 1972, the Stanley Angwin arrived in Antwerp for breaking up. It left a legacy of communications repairs and modern coaxial cables, and is represented in photographs and models, and in the memories of those who sailed on board during its 20-year career. <laughs>